Hi you! If this isn't the first time you're hearing me, welcome back to the channel. I've said it in a number of community posts and do shorts now, but I just wanted to say thank you again to everyone who subscribed and engaged with me last year. I didn't expect to crack 100 subscribers towards the end of the year, so that was a really nice holiday present. Again, thank you. To everyone else who is joining us for the first time, this is your smart older sister, and today we're going to be talking about New Year's resolutions. Notes and references, as usual, will be at the end of the video and or the description. I hope you enjoy, and if you don't, well, I hope you at least have something to think about. There was a time when I thought that people asking, should we even have resolutions? We're asking a trick question, because to me, the answer is yes, of course. I think I've mentioned before on here that I'm a Virgo rising, so every chance I have to reflect on what I've been doing and how I can do better goes into my fun time. It doesn't even have to happen during the new year. I've always considered January to be a practice round for the year, which is another reason I'm so grateful for the Lunar New Year. My birthday is also another time when I like to take stock of how I've been doing and make attempts to change things. So I don't think that making resolutions is something confined to the start of the year. It's just nice to have that neat timeline marker. I generally like having fresh starts and there's also the fact that during the start of a new year, you're usually in the company of others who are trying to improve their lives. So it's almost like a community thing for me and those close to me to make New Year's resolutions and see which of us can stick to them. That being said, I do now know that for some people, New Year's resolutions are very arbitrary impositions that can be a big source of anxiety and frustration. I don't want to psychologize this too much. But I've noticed that among people I know personally, the ones most violently opposed to setting resolutions are usually those who don't like self-reflection for whatever reason. You probably know someone like this, the kind of person who is so defensive about their lives that there's nothing in them that they accept is in their power to change. These people are in a very small minority though, and most people who don't set resolutions that I know personally are people who don't think they'll be able to stick to them. We'll unpack that later on. But when I was doing some research on this topic, I found something interesting. And before we move on, I just wanted to share this because I love it when I find something in my research that surprises me. So being mostly Asian and having grown up in Asia, I took for granted that people just made New Year's resolutions. I read this beautiful article by Taiko Shiota for the Asia Society, where she talks about how they celebrated New Year in Osaka during her childhood, before the Second World War. Describing the very first day of the year, which many people then apparently spent an intense week preparing for, she writes, After breakfast, all members of the household, including the employees of the shop, sat in front of father, waiting for their turn to tell him their New Year's resolutions and receive the traditional New Year's gift money, called Otoshidama. That sounds fantastic, right? Tell me how you're going to improve, then you get this money. Of course, I'm reading that on the assumption that you get your money only if you have a New Year's resolution, but it probably was the case that receiving the money was something wholly apart from having a New Year's resolution. Anyway, Miss Taiko does note towards the end of our article that Japan no longer celebrates the New Year as elaborately now, but considering Japan's culture of constant improvement, which they call Kaizen, I would be deeply surprised if they didn't carry on listing New Year's resolutions. 
in the Philippines at the end of 2022, as many as 74% of people surveyed said they would change themselves for the better in the coming year and make New Year's resolutions. In the limited time I had to look, I couldn't initially find comparable surveys in some countries across Asia, but as I was starting my research, the little data I had validated my belief that most people made New Year's resolutions and I wouldn't, in fact, have to make much of a pitch to my viewers to keep doing it or to start doing it. After all, hasn't making New Year's resolutions been embedded in all cultures across time? The historian Sarah Pruitt wrote a very interesting timeline that tracks how long we've been doing this, which I strongly suggest you read, even though I will recap the fun bits here. When the Babylonians began celebrating their new year in March or April with a religious ceremony called Akitu, they made promises to the gods like paying off their debts. Fast forward a few thousand years, Julius Caesar decided to move the new year to January 1st in honor of Janus, the two-faced god who looks back into the past and forward into the future. Apparently, the Romans would sacrifice to Janus, reflect on their past, and promise to do better in the future, which honestly is super funny to me considering what we know about how the ancient Romans behaved, but hey, they were trying, right? Which is the point. I figured that if people from thousands of years ago were into self-improvement and self-reform, maybe it's something innately human to strive for this. Then I found surveys published by YouGov. The first one noted that in the U.S., only 34% of individuals surveyed said they would be making New Year's resolutions in 2024. That's not as low as the percentage of people in the UK who said that they would be making New Year's resolutions, only a spare 19%. That is shocking to me. So I then went on to look for a survey that compared different populations because that was such a weird poll for me. I guess it depends on the research methodology because I saw in the Ipsos Global Predictions for 2023 that 74% of 24,000 people surveyed across 36 countries were actually going to make New Year's resolutions. In that survey, they found that as many as 91% in Peru, 90% in Colombia and Mexico, and 89% in China said that they were going to make New Year's resolutions. The Netherlands, 45%, Japan, 41%, and Sweden, 35%, were the only countries where a minority would be making resolutions for the new year. Because it's convenient right now and parsing methodology is totally not the point of this video, let's just say that most of us want to do New Year's resolutions. Wonderful. The point of the last five-minute digression was that I was wrong to assume that everyone just makes New Year's resolutions. What about the minority who don't? I could just ask you to watch my other videos while you wait for February content but that's not how we roll on this channel. And since we've had enough tangents in this preliminary segment already, I'll give you one good reason for making New Year's resolutions this year in under one minute. Having goals is good for you. Goals are essentially what New Year's resolutions are. The only thing is that you set your goals at the start of the year. Yes, you'll have to think about what your goals are and how you're going to achieve them, but the time it takes to do this is minuscule compared to the clear benefit of setting these goals. If you set goals just logically, you're more likely to achieve them. I will likely get to the grocery today if I decide to go there as opposed to just wandering around aimlessly. Or in the much more inspirational words of Zig Ziglar, people do not wander around and then find themselves at the top of Mount Everest. And when I do get to the grocery store as I intended, my brain rewards me with a glorious hit of dopamine 
that makes me more capacitated to achieve more things. So you're better off setting goals and making resolutions than not. Or, in the words of Terence Stamp's character in Yes Man, You'll be making a promise to yourself. And when you break a promise to yourself, things can get a little dicey. And if you're still not convinced by that, that's fine too. Maybe you're fine where and how you are. If you ever decide that you're not, you know where to find this video. When I was writing the script for this video, I initially started out by compiling surveys done across the world and picking out the most common New Year's resolutions, which, if I recall correctly, were improving mental health, getting fit, and eating better. My original plan was to list these three resolutions and walk you through all my suggestions for how to achieve them, referencing my favorite self-help books, published research, and personal experience. Then that plan hit a snag when I started reviewing my favorite self-help books, and so this segment is not only how you should achieve your New Year's resolutions, but also about a book that changed my life. This is the part of the video where I introduce you to Professor Richard Wiseman. He's a psychology professor at the University of Hertfordshire, and in 2010, he published 59 Seconds, Change Your Life in Under a Minute. I don't usually pitch books as life-changing, but this actually was for me because he gives readers evidence-backed advice for how to actually improve yourself and your life. I cannot stress enough that you should absolutely buy this book if you buy just one book this year. I mean, the impact of this book on what I know permeates this whole video. Zig Ziglar, the American author and motivational speaker I referenced earlier, I only know about him and went out to consume his material because Professor Wiseman referenced his words about Mount Everest in this book. But more than what I know, the chapter in this book on motivation had such an impact on how I think because it affirmed and helped explain how I hit my goals. And to be clear, I am kind of bragging here because Professor Weissman explains how most people don't hit their resolutions, but of the 10% that do, there were certain things they did, and I checked all but one. And that was before I read his book. Anyway, I've read a lot of more recent self-help books in the years since I picked up 59 Seconds, and while many of them were good, this is the book I come back to when I find myself struggling. Not with motivation, mind you, but with creativity, stress, happiness, and many of the other topics covered in it. If you've got time, I also suggest you check out Professor Wiseman's website, which I'll link in the description. He has some really great articles about New Year's resolutions that I think you should definitely check out if you need more expert advice. He's also on YouTube, so I guess you could say this video is very much a Notice Me Senpai video, just a step up from being a fan video. I guess the only other psychologist I might like more is Albert J. Bernstein of Emotional Vampires fame, but... Step 1. Know thine self. I think I alluded to this earlier, though glibly, before you even set goals, you should know what you're wanting to do or looking to change. Some people set New Year's resolutions on New Year's Eve when they're drunk or first thing New Year's Day when they're hungover. That's fine, but only assuming that you've already been thinking about your life and goals before the New Year. That's doable, right? There's that period of time between Christmas and New Year's when you're coming down from the highs or crawling out from the lows of Christmas that you can take a day or two to think before gearing up for the New Year, like maybe the 27th or 28th when you can just sit and be quiet and think about what you want. I spent a lot of that time being depressed last year 
because a family member had a medical emergency and while they're okay now, it really prompted a lot of personal soul searching. I also spent that time going over my resolutions for 2023 and crossing off what I'd accomplished. I did better in 2023 than I did in 2022 in terms of hitting my goals, so that was good. But I did notice that the few goals I failed to meet in 2023 are the same goals that I didn't hit in 2022. I didn't have time to dig up my resolutions from 2021 and further back, but one of those missed goals is something I've been trying to get myself to do for a while, so I wouldn't be surprised if I'd listed it as a resolution even before 2022. Now that we're in 2024, that goal is no longer on my list of resolutions because I took the time to think about it and frankly, it's not something that's as important to me as I thought. And there's a reason that I don't do it. So yeah, never mind. Not going to be a resolution this year. So take a few days to think about these things and be honest with yourself. Step two, write resolutions the right way. When I was looking up the most common New Year's resolutions, one thing that struck me was how vague many of those resolutions are. Let's take improve mental health. I swear I'm not being pedantic, but when you resolve to improve your mental health, what does that mean for you? Do you mean having fewer emotional meltdowns, feeling less stress, being happier, feeling more in control? What about getting healthier? Again, what is health for you? Not being in pain, having to take fewer medications, being able to run five miles without throwing up? You see what I'm getting at, right? When I write my resolutions, they're not very open to interpretation. When I had to gradually stop consuming alcohol in 2022, I didn't write moderate your drinking, which is how my very gentle doctor put it. I wrote no more than one glass of alcohol per day. When I decided to break out of the pandemic-related sluggishness that set in around 2021, I didn't write get fitter, I wrote, swim a hundred laps in a long course pool three times a week, which is what I used to be able to do when I was a competitive swimmer. I also listed a number of mountains I wanted to climb again and how far I wanted to be able to cycle in 30 minutes. I hit those goals at different points in the following year And as a result, I ended 2023 fitter than I was in 2022. Step three, have a plan. I'm talking about fitness a lot because I think it best demonstrates my points, especially when it comes to having a plan. You don't just jump into a pool and swim 100 laps one morning. I mean, after not having done it for years. I knew it would take time to hit that level of fitness, so I started with 10 laps and added 5 every 2 weeks. I hit my goal towards the end of the year. Same thing for climbing mountains. You don't just wake up one morning and attempt to summit a 3,000 meter peak. In fact, for one of the mountains I wanted to climb, The town set up checkpoints at the popular base camps because they didn't allow climbers who didn't have medical certificates specifically stating that the doctor found them fit to climb. This was after a string of deaths of people attempting to climb that mountain. When I wrote down the resolution to climb that mountain, I was also coming back from an episode of long COVID So yeah, when I say pandemic-related sluggishness, I do mean that I got COVID and it really messed me up. Anyway, the upside of that is I did what's called an exercise stress echocardiogram. That thing we see in film and television sometimes where they 
uh, run an ultrasound of your heart, make you run on a treadmill, and then take another ultrasound of your heart again. Part of what the stress echo measures is the metabolic equivalents or METs achieved during the exercise. I'm not a doctor, but my understanding is that METs is the ratio at which your body expends energy. That is the amount of oxygen consumed relative to your body weight. And your score is a predictor of your ability to tolerate exercise without producing unwanted symptoms. A score of less than 5 is poor, 5 to 8 is fair, 9 to 11 is good, and 12 or more is excellent. I scored 7.1 at the start of my return to fitness, which was both a relief and a disappointment. I was talking to my doctor about my mountain climbing goals, and while he was ready to sign my medical certificate to allow me to climb even then, He agreed with my plan to climb much smaller elevations before attempting that mountain again, which I had last climbed in my teens. And before climbing those smaller elevations, I also planned to go walking through some hills a few times a week as a way of warming up and getting used to walking in that kind of terrain. And to incentivize myself, To hit all these little sub-goals, I would tag them with rewards that were unlocked once I hit them, like a spa day or a new pair of earrings or that fancy glass nib fountain pen I'd been trying to make people buy for me since law school and can now finally afford to buy for myself. I know some people like to plan a huge reward for when they finally hit their goal or resolution, But honestly, for me, once you hit that big goal, that's the reward in itself. Finally, with respect to planning, one thing that I really urge you to keep in mind is that your willpower and motivation is a limited supply. So when your goal does not involve making yourself do something, but rather making yourself stop, any particular activity or behavior, be guided by the finding that the best tactic for shoring up self-control in that regard is avoidance. Over a decade ago, researchers published a meta-analysis of 102 studies on self-control. And from what I understand, they found that you actually exercise more self-control by avoiding tests to your willpower in the first place. Okay, let's back it up a bit. It's time to introduce you to yet another fantastic psychologist, namely Professor Denise de Ritter from Utrecht University. She was a researcher involved in the meta-analysis I'm talking about, but she and her colleagues also published another study in 2011 distinguishing between inhibitory and initiatory self-control. It had one of those fantastic titles that people in the social sciences love, which was, quote, not doing bad things is not equivalent to doing the right thing. Which makes sense when you think about it, right? You should definitely read the study, but even if you don't, it makes sense that the supply of willpower to do something is different from the supply of willpower to not do something. Now, to return to the meta-analysis, the consensus seems to be that when it comes to not doing something, the people who are the most successful are those whose behaviors are automatic rather than deliberate, meaning they're more successful when there's less effort. And how would there be less effort? Again, when you don't put yourself in the position to be tested in the first place, or what experts call proactive avoidance. One of Professor de Ritter's colleagues, Marlene Gilbart, published a really helpful article in 2018 where she summarizes how we understand self-control. She explains that across a range of studies, people with high self-control make it a point to avoid temptation to begin with. So, for example, 
when I was trying to lower my sugar intake for vanity reasons, seriously, cut your sugar for two weeks and get back to me about how soft your skin is, I avoided pastries like they were the plague. A relative who shares my love of baking tried to suggest that we learn how to make sugar-free pastries, but I knew I wouldn't be able to do it, so I had to give up baking for a while. Other than unsweetened tea and coffee, I didn't drink any beverages that weren't clear. I bought and prepared fruits and nuts for snacks so I wouldn't be tempted to go looking for candy. And I never looked at the dessert portion of the menu. I had fantastic skin for a while. And then I started working at this place where the snack bar was set up right outside my office. Visible to me through my glass walls. All those cookies waving at me from their fancy glass jars. I was gone. I was done. So don't just plan for how you're going to do something. Plan for how you're going to stop yourself from doing something. Step four, tell someone, I guess. I actually used not to do this until I read about it in 59 seconds because it felt weird to tell people what I hope to achieve. Like, why would they care? I did just find hitting my goals without having to tell people. But... Based on research, it does appear that the more people you tell about your goals, the more you want to do them. Citing a 1985 study, Professor Weissman writes, The greater the public declaration, the more motivated people are to achieve their goals. My way of doing this, because it also ups the stakes and somehow makes things less awkward for me, is to make bets with people. So I once bet a law school friend that if I fit into my teenage corset that once got my waist down to 21 inches, by the end of the year, she'd do cartwheels down our school entry hall on the first day of class the next semester. Yeah, that did not happen, and I won't get into what I had to do after losing that bet, but having that bet was highly motivating. So tell people if you think you need additional motivation to hit your goals. Step five, track your progress. Who doesn't love graphs? Especially if they tell you how well you're doing, right? Oh, just me? Fine. It doesn't have to be a graph. If you're trying to lose weight, one popular thing I've seen done is taking a photo of yourself every week or month to mark the changes. I know someone who took a photo every day of the year, which feels like it's a lot of work, but when she did the whole photo montage, it was amazing to watch, to be fair. One thing I did when I finally stopped drinking altogether was to deposit a fixed amount of money in a special savings account for every day I was sober. Basically equivalent to the amount of money I was saving because I wasn't spending it on drinks. Uh, never mind, I'm not going to tell you how much. And whenever I'd feel like drinking, I'd just log into the banking app and take a look at what was in that account. Because shockingly, I apparently like money a whole lot more than I like drinking. I emptied that account at the end of last year to pay for my Christmas gifts for everyone. But if I did that again this year, I'd probably have enough to fly first class for my next vacation. And then I can drink for free on the plane. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm not going back to drinking. And if you're drinking, I envy you. <laughs> okay. This video was a bit chaotic, wasn't it? Maybe I'm still recovering from the holidays. You probably know that surviving the holidays doesn't mean you come out of December at 100. Maybe I'm still adjusting to the new look. So what are your resolutions? I hope you'll share in the comments. I have almost 50, but then again, I have a lot I want to improve on. Don't get me wrong. I like myself a lot as I am. But I am not blind to the fact that I could be better. And 
I really look forward to the end of this year when I can look back and see how far I've come in that regard. I wish you all the best in whatever you hope to achieve this year and thank you for watching. Yeah, why did I think of Notice Me Senpai? Oh yeah, so many psychologists in this video. I think it's a hit. Do you know who Filthy Frank is? I was like, Konnichiwa Senpai. Please notice me. I watch Asian cartoons. <laughs>